Welcome to the Earth Science Classroom. So we're looking at seafloor spreading and we're looking at this new discovery that happened in the 60s. But let's do a little, little backtrack right now and let's go back to just where this came from. So the original idea came from Alfred Wegener of Cornell Drift in 1912, published in 1915, and then was translated in 1924, his book, The Origin of Continents and Oceans. And he had the five bits of evidence suggesting that the continents have drifted apart since the time of Pangaea, a supercontinent that existed about 250 million years ago. And since it's drifted apart to the present day locations of our continents. So that was a good, good idea with evidence to back it up. But there was one missing piece of the puzzle, which was that he couldn't prove how these continents moved. He thought it was tidal forces or they kind of went, the continents went through the ocean floor like a, an icebreaker through ice. And he died in 1930. And after which uh, various other scientists started to progress his, his theory, a gentleman by the name of Holmes in the 1930s looked at potentially a mantle derived convection current. And there kind of stood. And obviously during the 30s, late 30s, uh, before World War II broke out, kind of everything kind of took um, a little break in terms of science. And the science was not so much driven towards uh, discoveries in earth sciences, but really towards warfare. And obviously, in you know the periods of like 1939 to 19, oh, 1946, really, you have World War II, and you have this horrible war. In a war is terrible in general, right? And but war is done for certain means. Whether it's politics or power or land or to uh, take away uh, bad leaders or whatever, but war is done with some sort of purpose. It's not always clear, but there's some sort of purpose. But the one thing that war does do is it takes science and applies it in a way that can win the war for a certain side. So generally, historically, the side, the, the, the army that has the best weapons, you know, it used to be just the, the, the size of the Stalin army would be the one that wins. But, you know, as time and technology progressed, humans started to use that more than just the amount of, of soldiers. So technology played a huge part and science and engineering and the discovery of new ways to produce weapons, for example, the Manhattan Project with the nuclear bombs, kind of progressed warfare. And World War II was no was one of the biggest wars to apply these new discoveries in science and, and these new weapons. And there was a gentleman that a professor from Princeton that um, recruited into the U.S. Navy as a commander on one of the boats, the new boats they had. And he was in charge of a new technology uh, that was brought to um, fruition for the U.S. Army, or the, the, the NATO, the uh, Allied forces, was sonar. And it stands for sound navigation and ranging. And it's the application of echo sound basically used by certain animals to use sound waves to uh, locate and identify um, the environment around you. So the boat would send out uh, sound waves through the water and the sound waves would bounce off anything on the water and come back to the boat and the computer, the sonar machine would calculate uh, what was around the boat that they obviously couldn't see. So it was the eyes without looking, basically. And this was an advanced technology this boat had. 
to use during warfare to locate enemy subs, enemy boats, uh, enemy landmines or, or mines in the ocean, that kind of thing, to really just not to basically defeat the opponents. And this gentleman was called Harry Hess. And he served, and after the war had ended, he was in the position, well, during the, his time on, the, on the, the U.S. Navy in the boats, he would uh, survey and gather sonar reports and maps of the North Pacific, where he was stationed or working. And he found things like underwater mountains, underwater valleys, and guyots. Now, guyots are basically underwater, uh, flat top, uh, ancient volcanoes, basically. And he found them in the Pacific. And then after the war ended, he used that knowledge of sonar and the application of sonar, and he started to use that in his scientific experiments back at Princeton. So this was kind of a new way of locating things in the ocean. So fast forward to 1962. Hess is mapping the North Atlantic Ocean. All right. And he discovered in the middle of the ocean he discovered a large underwater mountain range. And it was unique because this mountain range extended all the way from the North Atlantic all the way through and around and down into the South Atlantic. So it was a very long, continuous underwater mountain range that really seemed like it didn't end, really. It was just endless. And he found this using sonar. And what he found was the mid-ocean ridge. Okay. So pretty much like this. So you got the, the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, you had the ocean floor, and you had this very pronounced, very high, tall, underwater mountain range that he found using sonar from his, from his boat, and he named it the ridge, and it was right smack in the middle of the ocean, and it was the first time that really anyone had discovered this because it was underwater and the use of this new uh, tech called sonar. So this is the introduction to Harry Hess, seafloor spreading, and the connection between Connell Drift, Alfred Wegener, uh, Holmes with the uh, mantle convection currents and the thermal movement. And the next few videos, we're going to look at the seafloor spreading in a larger diagram. So I do this in the classroom where I go through and draw it on the whiteboard or the smart board. And then we're going to look at the different uh, pieces of evidence that suggested that the seafloor is actually moving because in the past scientists didn't really uh, acknowledge the fact that the ocean floor could move they thought it was more static and stationary and that the continents were the ones that are moving like with uh, Wegener saying that the uh, continents would drive through the ocean crust like an icebreaker boat would through ice and obviously with the tidal forces moving the continents we know now that was uh, a little far-fetched for a piece of evidence, but it's all I could think of at the time, being 1915. So, yep, please uh, subscribe to the video, and uh, you'll see more on this channel with the seafloor spreading and different applications that I use in the classroom uh, about this topic.